In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, I am grateful to God for giving me this opportunity to be here with you today, especially on an occasion which is very important for us, and that is uh, Eid al-Ghadir, when we believe Prophet Muhammad asked thousands of people in his farewell pilgrimage to Mecca on the way back before people going to Medina and Yemen and other places separated to be present and he declared to them the will of God as he has done in other occasions that Imam Ali would be his successor. So I pray that this day would be a blessed day for all humanity. Uh, the theme is a very interesting theme, and I was <clears throat> very happy to see that I'm put in this panel to talk about learning in worship. And the way I understood it is that how even our worship should be an opportunity for learning. So as much as time permits, I would like to reflect on our way of understanding worship and then educational aspect of worship. You are familiar with uh, this verse in the Quran which talks about the aim of the creation. مَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ so these are three verses of the Quran which talk about why God created us, human beings. And we have also other verses in the Quran that I will refer to. But in this particular passage, God says he has created human beings and jinns for worshipping him according to some interpretation, or for serving him. I have not created neither jinns nor human beings, but to worship me or to serve me. And then says, I don't want them to feed me. I don't want from them sustenance. God himself is the provider of sustenance and he has power and he has strengths so our worship or service is for our own benefit not for the sake of benefiting God so this shows the significance of worship or service but interestingly we have a hadith from our six imam six imam of the Shia Muslims from Imam Sadiq Commenting on this verse, he says, To worship me or to serve me, which is the aim of creation, means to know me. So our mom says, the aim is ma'rifah, is knowledge. And in Arabic, ma'rifa is a special type of knowledge. Ma'rifa is different from ilm. We have ilm in Arabic, which means knowledge. It's very general. When you know something, even if it has not touched your heart, it has not brought emotions, still you can say, I know it, I have ilm. Ilm can be for something which has not touched your heart or has not produced any emotions. You have no connection. You have not acted upon it. You have not taken it on board. Still, you can say, I know it. Because it is in your mind. But when knowledge is very personal, it has engaged both your heart and mind, has affected your emotions, and you have a personal relation with what you know, 
This is ma'rifa. So for example, if there is a person that I have heard about him, I have read about him, I have seen him on TV, for example, but my knowledge of him is not very personal and intimate, I cannot say I have ma'rifa of him. But there is a person that I have I spend good time with him or her. I have lived with him or her. We have worked together. We have lots of memories together. Then I can say I have ma'rifa. So the idea of serving God or worshiping God is to reach ma'rifa. And you know, in Islamic <clears throat> terminology, when we want to refer to the people who have very deep connection with God, mystics, we say Arif. Arif is the one who has ma'rifa of God. Arif is the one who has personal relation with God. Not he has just a philosophical knowledge of God that there is, I don't know, unmoved mover, there is uncaused cause, for example, the prime mover, necessary being, all these things which are universal concepts. This is not Erfan, this is not Ma'rifa. Ma'rifa is very, very personal, very intimate. So, the aim of our creation is Ma'rifa. But why <clears throat> God didn't say in this verse, he could have said himself clearly why you know he had to say and then we have the commentary that means because the best way of reaching this ma'rifa is ibadah for us if we want to reach that deep, intimate, a strong understanding of God, it comes through worship. But what type of worship? What we find in Islamic sources is that there are people who are engaged with worship only superficially. They exercise acts of worship but they are not really worshiper maybe there are people that constantly pray and recite and every day they fast every night they keep awake whispering to God these are very important, but we cannot judge about their quality unless we know what is happening at the same time in their hearts and minds. Our hadith tells us, don't be deceived by just looking at how much acts of worship they have. For example, you know, when we pray, our ritual prayer, as you know, at certain point, we bend. We call it ruku. Then we prostrate. So it's very important not to rush. When you bend, take your time and be aware of the moment and mean what you say in that particular time. You know, we glorify God at that time and praise Him. Also, when we prostrate, we should take our time and we have saying that aqrabu ma yakun al abdu min rabbihi an yakuna sajidan similar to this that that's the nearest time that we get to god in the prayer which is the nearest opportunity that we have to god in our life when you are prostrated but hadith says Despite all the significance that we attach to this ruku and sujood, bending and prostration, hadith says, "La tanzuru ila tula ruku al rajul wa sujood." Don't just look at how long it takes them when they bend or when they prostrate. Maybe this has become a habit. 
they do it automatically. It's a routine. And they do it habitually without understanding. If you want to see how good someone is, don't just look at their acts of worship. Look at something else. And here is a very important point. And I want to explain the connection. First, let me finish the hadith and I'll explain the connection. The hadith says, look at their truthfulness and trustworthiness. Sidq al-hadith wa ada al-aman. When they speak, do they tell the truth or they may lie? When someone entrusts them something, do they deliver the trust back or not? We may think, what's the relation between ruku and sujood, bending and prostration, or trustworthiness and truthfulness? But this shows that if you are doing your acts of worship properly, if in addition to physical engagement, you are mentally and spiritually engaged, it makes you a better person. It makes you a humble person. And when you are humble, when you are not selfish, when you are not arrogant, then all the vicious characteristics disappear. And above all, Islam says some of the most vicious things that can happen is not to be honest, not to be truthful, and also to betray trust of people. So if I am a good worshiper and my body, heart, and mind in our, are in harmony with each other, then I become a better person. And Imam Ali says, every day you become a better person. Not every year or every decade. Every day. Man tasawa magbun. Even if two of your days are the same, you are a loser. If I am not somehow better than me yesterday, I have lost. So, worship is certainly involving understanding, but also a spiritual connection and improvement in our morality. But then, what we have, which was also mentioned just before we ended for break, that also there are many ways that we can learn when we worship. When is the best opportunity for you to learn? If I want to learn in a conventional way, okay, I go to a library, I go to a school, I open my book, I start reading, I take lessons. These are very, very important. But the time that you actually learn new things, you can digest and more than anything else, you can be inspired. Is when your body and heart and money, and sorry, heart and mind and body are connected and you are tuned to God. That God can inspire you. So, this is very important why in Islamic, you know, seminaries, in Islamic traditional way of education, we always go to the classroom with evolution. As we are going to mosque and we are ready to say prayer, we go to take lesson with evolution. We start with prayer. We say, oh God, please take me away from darkness of illusion. And please honor me with the light of understanding. Oh God, please open to us the treasures of your knowledge. 
So going with this a state of mind and heart that you are worshiping God in learning then opens your heart and mind for receiving knowledge and inspiration. And it is very interesting that when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered mosque and saw two groups of people in the mosque one group were worshipping. Another group had a circle and they were learning and discussing. The Prophet said both are doing good. But he went to those who were discussing and studying. Inside the mosque. But he went for those who are studying. So even mosque is a school. And he said... God has sent me as a teacher, not as master of worshippers. <laughs> of course, it's very important to worship, but if your worship is properly, it becomes learning. Therefore, we have this hadith that if you have two people, one of them is worshipping for one year, not normal worship like minimum that we do. Because, you know, every day we do 17 rak'ah of prayer. Five times we pray. It takes, say, 20 minutes, half an hour. But if someone is worshipping the whole year, not only fasting in the months of Ramadan, throughout the year. So this is one person. Another person is a believer in God, but he tries to get closer to God by contemplation. He does his obligatory worship. But he is also engaged through contemplation. Which one is better? Hadith says, Tafakkur sa'ah afdal min ibadat sana. If you contemplate for sa'ah, sa'ah we say hour, but it was not hour because hour is something new. You know, it's a, in a portion of time. If you think and contemplate for a portion of time, like an hour, for example, it's better than one year of worship. Of course, means one year of worship without understanding and contemplation. And in some versions, it says better than 60 years of worship. Depending on the quality of contemplation. So, my idea is, and I say it to our community whenever I am talking about education and about, you know, worship, I say anything that we do, whether it is holding classes, lectures, morning, celebration, has to have a clear element of ma'rifah. Something about knowledge and understanding. We should not just worship. We should not just celebrate. Or we should ju not just mourn. Without thinking when we go out. Have we improved in our understanding? Have we improved in our intellectual as well as a spiritual connection with God? Or we have just enjoyed ourselves with doing something emotionally? Emotions in Shia tradition are very important, but they are not the main forces. Emotions are fruits, not the engine, not the root. The root, the engine, the power come from ma'rifah, from understanding. So I think this is a great responsibility for all People who are involved in education, whether it be teachers, parents, uh, religious leaders, that we should highlight this aspect of worship and religious life. That we should always be ready for learning, discussing, contemplation. And we should try to gain through everything that we do a better encounter with God and a better relation with people by humbling ourselves 
through worship. Thank you very much. Friends, we have now 14 minutes before we need to break and move on to the next part of our agenda. So I would open the floor 